When I was young, I did eagerly visit philosophers and saints and heard great arguments about this and that. But every time I came out the same door I went in. Genesis chapter 1, verse 25. And God made the beast of the earth after his kind, and cattle after their kind, and everything that creepeth upon the earth after his kind. And God saw that it was good. And God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. And God blessed them. And God said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth chapter 2 verse 7 and the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and man became a living soul and out of the ground the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every fowl of the air and brought them unto Adam to see what he would call them and whatsoever Adam called every living creature was the name thereof. The sequence of events in Genesis 2 contradict the events in Genesis 1. In Genesis 1, Adam or man was created simultaneously with one. In Genesis 2, she was taken from man's rib. And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam, and he slept. And he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh instead thereof. And the rib which the Lord God had taken from man, he made a woman and brought her unto the man. the contradiction in the times and the creations of the animals are different in both chapters. In chapter 1, the animals were created first. In chapter 2, Adam was created and then the animals were created. Then Eve was created from Adam. This sequence of events is completely different. When we look deeper into Genesis, the argument has been made that Genesis 1 and Genesis 2 have two separate creation accounts. In Genesis 1.26, in the King James Version, God says, let us make man in our image after our likeness, and paraphrasing, and have dominion over the creatures of earth. Genesis 1.27 says, so God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. Continuing into Genesis chapter 2 verse 7. And the Lord God formed man out of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. There are a few points to reconcile here. 
in Genesis 127, male and female were chronologically created at the same time, as it seems simultaneously within the sequence of creation. The creation of male and female were also after the creation of whales and creatures of the sea, winged fowl, reptiles, and beasts of the earth. In contrast, the sequence of events in Genesis 2 contradict the original order of creation in Genesis 1. Genesis 2 verses 18 through 19 in the King James Version states, It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make and help meet for him. And out of the ground formed every beast of the field and every fowl of the air and brought forth them to Adam to see what he would call them. In this account, Adam was formed from the ground before the beasts of the earth and the fowl of the air. This account is in direct contradiction to the previous text in the first chapter of Genesis. Furthermore, in Genesis 1, it states, God created man in his own image. In Genesis 2, it stated that he was formed from the dust of the ground. So which story is true? It's important to note that the name Adam wasn't used until Genesis 2.19, when he was naming the beasts of the field. Could the truth be mutually exclusive to either one of these stories based off a person's cultural beliefs? Is the image of God in fact the dust of the ground? Or are there two different stories of two different creations being integrated into the same story? Even more imperative to understand what's the difference between God and Lord God as it is written in the text. Is God and Lord God as it is written in the King James Version the same entity? Or are they two different beings? If they are two different beings, which one has dominion over the other? Does God have dominion over Lord God? Or does Lord God have dominion over God? In the context by which the reader understands, the hierarchy of creation is of utmost importance. In almost every case, the context of the word Lord and God means a specific title given to a higher authority, but not always to something or someone non-human. In the context of Genesis, however, the words are referring to a being more than human, yet with human qualities in a sense, because the Genesis 1 male was created in the image of God. The image, character, and personification of God in Genesis 1 and 2 still requires further examination. For this, we will cross-analyze the King James versions of Genesis with the Targum from the Aramaic translation to shed more light on the story of Genesis. Again, we read in Genesis 126, and the Lord God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. This verse implies some level of plurality when the text states, let us make man. The implication there is participation by more than one being. In addition, these beings are somewhat peers or at least share a likeness due to the context of the phrase in our image. However, in the Aramaic, the verse looks quite different. This section begins differently. It states, and the Lord said to the angels who ministered before him, 
who had been created in the second day of creation of the world. Let us make man in our image, in our likeness. Any version of scripture translated and printed after 1456 would subtract some of the most important contextual details of creation. The angels have been altogether subtracted from the entire creation story of newer versions. And again, we can see the intermingling of characterizations between angels and the Lord, as he is called in this version. Continuing from the Aramaic translation, and the Lord created man in his likeness, translated into, and the word of the Lord created man in his likeness, in the likeness of the presence of the Lord, he created him. Male and his yoke fellow, he created them. A few things to reconcile here. He was created in the likeness of the presence of the Lord and also by the word of the Lord. This implies that man was created by word of the Lord in this part of Genesis during the initiation of male and female into the world. They were not brought forth from the earth or taken from the dust of the ground. The genetics of men uniquely belong to their individual ancestry, and that ancestry is biologically related to the region of Earth they were created to inhabit. This ideology of creation contradicts the accepted narrative that states that a single origin of development is the foundation of the human species and that single species evolved over time into every race on earth and though this theory is held in highest regard within the halls of academia it has come into question by the most basic modern studies of genetics and anthropology This entire field of study was ruled by the most prominent families who abandoned ethical practices and applications of science for the sake of developing a historical narrative founded in Eurocentrism. Ethnological journals of the early 19th century were flooded with supposed evidence of Negro savagery and inferiority. These renowned scientists often made the comparison between Negroes and chimpanzees, believing that Negroes were a race that was closely related to the great apes of Africa. Around the same time, fossil remains of human-like species began to be excavated in areas throughout Africa. These remains were not of a modern human or a current species of primate, but something that appeared in between. Throughout the course of the next century, ethnologists and anthropologists alike started developing theories about the development of these in-between humanoid hominin species. 
The acceptable baseline for any theory to be considered legitimate and stand up under the scrutiny of science was the out of Africa theory. This was a contentious debate within the science world. Many polygenists found serious issue with the presupposed blanket origins of all mankind and argue that the origins of the races began with progenitors who were distinctly unalike from one another. The book Races of Men, a work by Robert Knox, inspired polygenism throughout Europe in the early 1800s, which was the philosophy that stated each race as a different species. Most polygenists believed in Caucasian racial superiority, but also debated the number of various other ethnological classifications, such as the overall number of racial types. Caucasian, Mongolian, and African were the initial titles given to the races of men. But as the study of ethnology grew, Distinctions such as American Indian, Malayan, and Australian were added. In the mid-1800s, Charles Pickering published the extensive work entitled races of man and their geographical distribution an ambitious project self-proposed as an analytical synopsis on the natural history of man pickering along with samuel morton and louis agassi contributed to the most comprehensive ethnological publication to that date entitled types of mankind in 1854 this was considered a revolutionary work of the time. They followed this work with a book entitled Indigenous Races of the Earth in 1857. The argument around polygenism and monogenism had reached the highest levels of scholarly critique and polygenism had found legitimacy among the scientific community. Many people believed that each race had distinctly different origins. As publication after publication was written by pluralists of the time supporting that position. Renowned archeologist Ephraim Squire studied and excavated several hosts of mounds in the Mississippi Valley during the mid 1800s. He is recognized as a preeminent source of pre-Columbian mound builder civilizational history. Since his discoveries, the Smithsonian has issued a relative gag order on all history before 1492. Squire excavated skulls from some of the mounds in the Mississippi Valley and sent them to scientist Samuel Morton, who found the characteristics verifiably similar to skulls found in Central and South America. This find further confirmed Morton's assertion that the American Indians had a common indigenous origin. Morton stated explicitly, the mound builders were an American Indian race of great antiquity and did not migrate from Asia. Their physical form has remained essentially unchanged in their descendants. In short, the appearance of the indigenous American has not changed over time and does not have Asian features. These people, more so than any other race, are more uniquely 
suited for this environment than any other region on Earth. This theory was supported by Louis Agassiz, a co-atomist who believed God created many various climactic, zoological, and biological zones, aka ecosystems, and people, plants, and animals are specifically designed and inclined to inhabit these specific environments. The theory surrounding polygenism started to take hold in overall popularity and this influenced many scientists who found interest in theology. But in 1859, Charles Darwin published Origin of Species and much of the public would begin to cast doubt on polygenism. And instead began to adopt a more monogenist philosophy concerning the history of man. Nonetheless, this dialectical deliberation would continue through the 20th century, but by this time, Darwinistic evolution was acknowledged as scientifically fashionable. But why did Darwinism become so fashionable? The transition of philosophical thought around this subject shifted dramatically over a short period of time. This intellectual dispute wasn't just a match between the ideas of men. It was an argument about the presence of God in the world of science. What responsibility did the great primordial spirit play in the creation of men? This was a question of science versus scripture, and the playing fields would be in the classrooms, the universities, and the churches. The lines between intellect and heresy were officially drawn, properly dividing the cattle into their chosen slaughter homes. In the beginning of Genesis 2, in both versions, the Targum and the King James, the Lord or God had finished by the seventh day and he rested from all the works in which he willed to make. Reading down to Genesis 2, we can see the title for the creator being has been changed in both versions. In Genesis 1.27 it states, so God created man in his own image. But Genesis 2, 7 states, And the Lord God formed man out of the dust of the ground. These two phrases are contradictory. Not only are there two different creations, there are also 
two different creators written into Genesis. In Genesis 1, so God created man in his own image implies a completely different title than Lord God. For example, the usage of the name Lord God in Genesis 2 versus God in Genesis 1. In the context of how Genesis 1 is written, God is a specific title, who is including us who is represented by the angels in Aramaic, but hidden in the King James Version. Again, Genesis 1.26 states, and God said, let us make man in our image. Genesis 1 did not state, and the Lord God said, let us make man in our image. This subtle indication of speech makes a distinct difference between God and Lord God, which means they are not the same. centuries has wandered in the desert, it is because this shamanic function has been either suppressed or forgotten, and we different images of the artists have been held up at different times. Uh, the artists as uh, artists that Genesis 2-7 in the King James reads, And the Lord God formed man out of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. However, the Aramaic reads, And the Lord God created man in two formations and took dust from the place of the house of the sanctuary and from the four winds of the world and mixed from all waters of the world and created him red, black, and white and breathed into his nostrils the inspiration of life and there was in the body of Adam the inspiration of a speaking spirit unto the illumination of the eyes and the hearing of the ears. The Aramaic has a much more detailed version of the Genesis 2 creation account we can see that man was created in two formations, together with the wind, water, and dust in three different colors, red, black, and white. There still remains some ambiguity as it concerns the two formations in which man was created. Earlier in the Aramaic text of Genesis, it states, And the Lord finished by the seventh day the work which he had wrought, and the ten formations which he had created between the sons. What could these formations between the sons be? Possibly the referenced formations are indeed constellations, yet we'll leave that discussion open for speculation.
Chapter four of Genesis of the King James Version opens with, and Adam knew Eve his wife, and she conceived and bare Cain, and said, I have gotten a man from the Lord. At this point, Eve makes a definitive statement in her phraseology to exclude Adam from the genealogy of her child Cain. Again, Eve states, I have gotten a man from the Lord. The wording in this phrase directly contradicts the table of nations phraseology. For example, in chapter five, the genealogy of the patriarchs uses the term begot. For example, Genesis 5, 6, Seth lived 105 years and begot Enos. And Seth lived after he begot Enos, 807 years, and begot sons and daughters. Comparing this version to the Targum, it reads, And Adam knew Hava, his wife, who had desired the angel, and she conceived, and bare Cain. And she said, I have acquired a man, the angel of the Lord. And she added to bear from her husband, Adam, his twin, even Abel. This version of the story reads completely different than does the King James or any newer version. Chapter four, verse one states in the King James version, Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived and bare Cain and said, I have gotten a man from the Lord not Lord God or God, but from the Lord. The King James Version is written in a deceptive sequence of events. A hidden fact within the text is that Eve conceived a child in Cain that wasn't the son of Adam, but the son of the Lord, which is translated into angel in the Aramaic. Genesis 4.26 in the King James states, And Adam knew his wife again, and she bare a son and called his name Seth. For God, said she, hath appointed me another seed instead of Abel, whom Cain slew. And to Seth, to him also there was born a son. And he called his name Enos. Then men began to call upon the name of the Lord. The Targum provides us with even deeper context into what's really going on in the story. The parallel verse in Genesis reads, And Adam knew his wife again at the end of 130 years after Abel had been slain. And she bare a son and called his name Seth. For she said, the Lord hath given me another seed instead of Abel, whom Cain slew. And to Seth was also born a son and he called his name Enosh. That was the generation in whose days they began to err and make themselves idols by the name word of the Lord. Once again, we read deeply within the context, Genesis 4.26 states specifically that she bare a son and called his name Seth, but uses the titles she uses to address the Lord's or God's will have been changed. Yet, according to the Aramaic, she states, the Lord have given me another son instead of Abel, whom Cain slew. This statement is completely independent of Adam. Even in the King James, it states for God, which is a different title than Lord who impregnated her. For God said she hath appointed me another seed instead of Abel, 
Boom Kane Sloop. Once again, using trick phraseology within an overly suggestive order and context, we see in verse 26, the line of Seth continues. And to Seth, to him also, there was born a son, and he called his name Enos or Enosh. Then men began to call upon the name of the Lord. The use of the word also is implicative of one obvious point. Not are there only two Enoses or Enoshes, there are also two Seths. Again, we read, and to Seth, to him also was born a son, and he called his name Enosh. The word also implies not only to Seth, but also to Eve. This seems to be purposely written as such as a method of confusing genealogy. This is the end of Genesis chapter four, which is a literary separation from the genealogy of the patriarchs. Chapter five makes a clear distinction between the Seth in Genesis four and the Seth son of Adam in Genesis five. It states, they were both called Adam in the day they were created. Contrastly, in the Aramaic, they were both called man in the day they were created and also blessed them in the name of his word. This phraseology is indicative of the first creation in Genesis 1, when male and female were created simultaneously and blessed them rather than the Genesis 2 creation when Adam was formed from the dust of the ground and Eve was taken from Adam's rib. The genealogy in Genesis 4 is the genealogy of Cain, which is completely excluded from the chapter 5 genealogy of the patriarchs. Instead, it is cleverly inserted before the true genealogy to foreshadow the confusion to come later in the chapter. All of the names in Cain's direct lineage mirror the names of the first patriarchs. Cain's sons included names like Enoch, Lamech, Methuselah, and of course, Enos, which is another hidden secret in Genesis chapter four. Could the father of Enos have been Cain? It would seem reasonable since the entire chapter mostly tells the story of the outcome of the line of Cain. This leads to deeper questions. If chapter four is truly the lineage of Cain and of half human, half angel hybrids, could that also mean that Cain impregnated his own mother with Enos? In chapter four of the Targum, it states the 130 years after Abel had been slain. Then later in chapter five, it states, and Adam lived 130 years and begot Seth, who had the likeness of his image, of his similitude. For before Havah had born Cain, who was not like to him, and Abel was killed by his hand. This confirms beyond doubt that there are indeed two different Seths. Again, in chapter four, Seth is born 130 years after Cain kills Abel. But in chapter five, Seth is born in the 130th year of Adam's life, which means unless Adam was able to know his wife at the moment of his own conception, there are indeed two Seths. The son of Adam, who was born before Cain, according to chapters four and five of the Targum, and the second Seth of Eve was born 130 years after the death of Abel. Only the Seth of Adam is included in the Genesis 5 genealogy of the patriarchs. The 
King James Version of Genesis 6.19 reads, And every living thing of all flesh, two of every sort, shalt thou bring into the earth to keep them alive with thee. They shall be male and female. Verse 20 reads, Of fowls of their kind, of cattle, of every creeping thing. But in the Aramaic, it is an angel who assists in the collection of animals into the ark. This is an important detail missing from the King James Version. With this being a question about Noah more so than Adam, it is important to analyze Genesis chapter 10, which are the generations of Noah. One major list of details missing from the King James Version that is included in the Aramaic translation are the territories belonging to the sons of Noah. They are not mentioned. However, in the Targum, they are included. It reads, the sons of Japheth, Gomer, and the name of their provinces, Afriki, Garmania, and Madai, Macedonia, and Yatania, and Asia, and Tharki, and the sons of Gomer, and the name of their provinces, Asia, Farquid, and Barbaria, and the sons of Javan, Elisha, and the name of their provinces, Alastaram, Italia, and Dordonia. From these were distributed the tribes of the islands of the Gentiles, everyone according to his language, to his kindred in their nations, and the sons of Ham directly after the mention of the isles of the Gentiles. The placement of this phrase before the line of Ham implies inclusion in the former statement rather than its literal separation in the text. Continuing, and the sons of Ham, Cush, and Mitzrayim, and Phut, and Canaan, and the name of their provinces, Arabia, Mitzrayim, and Ali Krak, and Canaan, and the sons of Cush, Seba, and Havila, and Sevetka, and the name of their provinces, Sinarai, Hindiki, and Samadi, and Lubai, and Zingai, and the sons of Moritinos, Smargad, and Mazad. These are the islands of the Gentiles and the homes of Japheth and Ham. The King James reads, chapter 10, verse 21, unto Shem also the father of all the children of Eber, the brother of Japheth, the elder, even unto him children were born. A descriptive phrase missing from the text that is included in the Aramaic, describing Shem in great fear of the Lord. And unto Eber were born two sons. The name of one was Peleg, for in his days the earth divided, and his brother's name was Joktan, and Joktan begat Amodad, and Shelef, and Hazarmaveth, and Jerah. The corresponding scripture in Aramaic describes Elmodad as the one who measured the earth with lines. And Shalef as the one who led forth the waters of rivers. Neither one of these details are found in the King James text. However, we do find an unnecessary Japheth insertion in verse 20 which seems to be dubiously placed within the text. Nonetheless, specific details concerning borders and geography are completely missing from all newer versions. Chapter 12, verse 1. Now the Lord said unto Abraham, Get thee out of thy country, and from thy kindred, and from thy father's house, unto a land that I will show thee. 
But getting back to the sons of Noah, whose lineage populated the earth after the flood, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, we first need to break down the characteristics of each lineage over time, beginning with the flood, and what aspects of each son's nature can lead us in the right direction. But even before we establish the character of each lineage, we have to make sure the same parallel names do not exist past Seth. One thing about scripture, if you jump ahead to Abraham too fast, you're bound to miss something. But now we have begun reading the word with fresh eyes and renewed understanding. Sometimes I feel like happiness is just a warm gun When you're born under fire signs and look up at the form suns And I done made so many trips around it Now it seems like I'm suspended in time, I stop counting And I remember when I climbed down off my mountain Following the stream of thought, looking for the fountain You see it's really tough for an immortal being To walk beside the river hoping he can find a spring and a new beginning Cause I done seen so many endings, credits roll, let us roll lead to another episode And the cycle keeps repeating, so my rifle keeps repeating Try to keep these demons down and fight until you even Homie, I ain't even breathing, homie, that ain't even air Though it seems like I'm the only one who ain't even scared Compared to the affairs of those who ain't aware And can't see the ghosts that float around everywhere Behind every stairwell, under every chair Bound by the carousel that only moves parallel shit Everything that's anything is trying to break through There's levels to this shit, so where the fuck you trying to take you? But we your tongue, sometimes life is like a bus station So you ain't really doing much, just waiting and it's frustrating, so trapped inside a body Try to hit the elevator, but can't make it past the lobby the difference between the God in Genesis 1 and Lord God in Genesis 2? If male and female were created after the fish, fowl, and beasts, why is Adam in Genesis 2 created before the beasts who were formed from the dust? If male and female were created on the sixth day together, in Genesis 1. How could Adam have slept while Lord God took his rib to form woman? Wouldn't that mean she was formed the next day? If Adam had Seth before Eve had Cain and Abel, who is Seth's real mother? And since we know that the Seth in Genesis 4 is not Adam's son, does that mean Cain and Eve conceived the child? If not, why would Seth be mentioned in the chapter 4 lineage of Cain? Furthermore, why would Seth name his son Enos?
exactly the same name as the son of Adam? And why would the descendants of Cain continue to copy the names of the sons of Adam? Why are there two different stories being meshed together using characters with parallel names? Did the author of the text purposely deceive the reader? Or was it written this way on purpose? Could it be possible that there were two flood accounts, two arcs, and two Noah's? These questions and more on the next episode of The Smartest Beast in the Field.